Let's pray as we open up the word. Father God, it is a privilege for us to be able to open up your word. We invite your Holy Spirit that Jesus would speak to us this morning, that you would give us a word that we can take away and think about and reflect on. In Jesus' name, amen. I remember when we first came to North Queensland, and the week before Trevor was appointed to a particular church board, he was covered in sand fly bites all over his legs, large welts all over his arms. It was terrible. And the irritation was so severe, it was literally driving him crazy. And what I noticed about this situation was not just our initiation into the experience of North Queensland insects, but I understood that it was more than what it seemed. It was part of an agenda to frustrate us away from what God had called us to. And when I recognised that and I prayed along those lines, the irritation quickly settled down. They, it went away. It wasn't just about insects. There was another spiritual reality that was at play. And what I needed to recognise is that Jesus is bigger than midges, bigger than the irritation, bigger than the frustration and the pain, bigger than the agenda to drive us away from the call that we had been given. There are so many things that can try and shake us and undermine us and tear us apart. It might be something small like tiny little midges or it might be something that is large and devastating. But if it moves us away from God's call on our life, they are both equally effective. Yet Jesus is calling his church to be a people who can stand firm and be unshakable. We are considering the group of prophetic letters written by the Apostle John while he was incarcerated on the Isle of Patmos. These letters were given to John by Jesus in a vision to seven churches in Asia Minor. This was during the time when the Emperor Domitian reigned in Rome. He was a cruel and ruthless tyrant. He was worshipped as God and required unquestioned flattery and praise to maintain his divine status. Last week, we looked at the first of these letters Jesus wrote, and that was the letter to the church in Ephesus. And we saw how God is changing the narrative from a powerless, oppressive world to acknowledging that Jesus is our risen king, the one who will prevail and rule and reign forever with justice and compassion and glory and honour. God is calling his church to be a people who hold consistent love. The next letter that the Apostle John wrote was to the church in Smyrna. Smyrna was a city about 56 kilometres north of Ephesus. The city was a Roman commercial trade port on the Aegean Sea. It was on the Roman network of roads. So there was no particular hierarchy of importance to the order that these letters were written. It was just following the Roman main roads around the region, like the mail route. And Smyrna was the next community on that road. The distribution of these letters was logical, first to Ephesus, then to Smyrna, and then on to the other churches along this highway. It was intended that the, these churches would read each of these letters all together. So what do we know about Smyrna? Smyrna is the contemporary Turkish port city of Izma. It is the Turkish third largest city, and it's known as the Pearl of the Aegean. 
Today, it's widely regarded as the most westernised city in Turkey in terms of values, ideology, gender roles and lifestyles. Smyrna was built by one of Alexander's great generals. Even with this long history, very little of the ancient Smyrna city has been excavated. However, they have uncovered some significant community areas. The most famous is the community Agora. The Agora was the open marketplace, the place of assembly, where the landed citizens would gather for military duty or they would hear announcements or debate ideas. The Agora was also used as a shopping plaza. The word agoraphobia, the fear of public situation, derives its meaning from that root word agora. And they have also excavated a public theatre in Smyrna and sections of the Roman aqueduct. So apart from these areas, today little remains of the ancient city. But it gives us a taste of the culture and the sophistication of this community. Scholars believe that the, script, the city grew to be about 100,000 citizens by the time the Apostle Paul and John were ministering in these areas. So this was a city that's much larger than our own, similar in population to a community, say, the size of Cairns or, or Toowoomba. When this letter was written, we were not talking about a small, remote Turkish village. This was a prosperous, bustling Roman port that had important commercial influence. And the Christian church in Smyrna faced very strong opposition from traditional Jewish uh, people. There was always a substantial Jewish quarter in Smyrna, long before the New Testament times, right through to the Ottoman period. Even today, various Jewish synagogues were located throughout the modern city. This city had a strong history of persecution against Christians, and there are historical accounts of Bishop Polycarp being martyred in Smyrna. Tradition says Polycarp was appointed as a pastor to the church in Smyrna by the Apostle John and was mentored by him. This is part of a letter that Polycarp of Smyrna wrote to the Philippian church. It says this, Let us therefore, without ceasing, hold fast to our hope and by the earnest of our righteousness which is Jesus Christ who took our sins in his own body upon the tree, who did not sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, but for our sakes he endured all things that we might live in him. Therefore, let us become imitators of his endurance. And if we should offer for his name's sake, let us glorify him." For he gave us this example in his own person that we believe this. If we should suffer, let's do it for the glory of Jesus. Polycarp refused to burn incense to the Roman emperor and was subsequently sentenced to death to be burned at a stake. There are stories that some fundamental Jews carried firewood on the Sabbath day in support of Polycarp's execution. In his final words, Polycarp said this, Eighty and six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and saviour? Tradition says that because the fire wasn't touching Polycarp, they eventually stabbed him to death with a spear. Jesus' letter to Smyrna was written before all this happened. So this is a letter that Polycarp would have read from the hand of John himself. So let's read it from Revelation chapter 2. From verse 8. 
to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Jesus' letter to Smyrna is quite different to the letter written to the Ephesian church. It does not really look at what they're doing well and what they have neglected. Instead, Jesus offers words of comfort to this courageous church. Jesus talks to them about what they will see, what they will experience, what they are going through, reminding them never to forget what it is that they cannot see. This letter becomes a comparison of two very different realities, what is seen and what is felt, what is battering them, and what is the spiritual reality that is more enduring, more per pervasive, just as real, and in reality, more powerful. Jesus immediately starts with the reminder of who he is. I am the first and the last, the one who died and came to life again. Remember last week, we spoke about how the followers of Jesus would not add Jesus into the hierarchy of Roman gods or follow the Roman imperial cult where the emperor was worshipped as God, calling him my Lord and my God. That was the problem for Polycarp. He refused to burn incense to the emperor as God. Instead, Christians insisted that Jesus was above all other gods. They insisted that Jesus did actually physically rise from the dead and his Holy Spirit dwelt in every believer. They insisted that Jesus was not just a ghost or an ethereal spirit, but a man, the Son of God, who died and came to life again in a physical body. The physical resurrection of Jesus was a difficult thing for the Roman imperial cult because the emperor was the only god with flesh on. And by law, every person conquered by Rome was required to worship him. And Jesus starts his letter by saying he's the first and the last. This speaks to a different reality, not just here and now, but eternity is real. Jesus is the start and the finish. In Greek, he is the Alpha and the Omega. In Hebrew, he is the Aleph and the Tav, the A and the Z, the beginning and the end. It is a reminder that Jesus is the head of their church who has the last word, not the circumstances around them. Jesus is the one who died and came to life Again, And they were absolutely correct to stand by this truth and not water it down. This is declaring Jesus is omnipotent, the one who is all-powerful. It is a reminder that Jesus, who looked defeated and looked crucified, but his body came back to life. He is victorious over the most oppressive enemies and ultimately over death. These were important reminders because the things that Jesus refers to in this letter are not things anyone would want to hear. No one wants to know trouble is coming. This letter is from Jesus who walks among them and who knows what is happening. He knows his followers in this community are suffering. There is no lived experience of any prosperity doctrine just now. 
They are actually living in poverty. This means they were unemployed or unemployable. This means they were struggling to feed their families and struggling to make ends meet. It wasn't coming together for them. Yet, Jesus says, yet, that important little word which defines a parallel reality that they experience as his church. Yet, you are rich. You have an enduring reality that is not dependent on stuff. There is a level of richness and prosperity and the fulfillment that is abundant and enduring, the type of wealth that is their true inheritance. Jesus sees and knows that the church in Smyrna is afflicted. They carry real burdens. They experience real trouble. Jesus doesn't minimize their experience and try to positive speak them out of it. Yet... Even in these circumstances, at the same time, his words are also infused with comfort and strength. Jesus hears the slander and the lies that are spoken or were spoken against his people. He hears the trumped up charges and the defamation spoken. He hears the gossip and the hate speak. He knows about the false representation that those in authority are speaking about Jesus and the kingdom of God and the evil done in God's name. Jesus knows of all the pain and the hardship that these words have had and the impact they make. These people even said that they were true worshippers of Jehovah God and that others are not. They use their position of power against others for their own gain. And then Jesus makes a very controversial statement. They think they are serving God, but really they are of the synagogue of Satan. They are so misaligned and so far away from the truth that they are going in the opposite direction to what they have represented themselves to be. And they may not even realize. Jesus takes what is terminal and final and absolute, and he makes it temporary. Humans see death as the end. Jesus says that he holds a different reality, the reality of life, life that goes on. The second death, that eternal separation for God, that is something they do not have to worry about. That will not hurt them. He calls attention to the crown of life that he holds. And Jesus has the authority to pass that on. A crown is a designation of royalty. This week, King Charles III is having his coronation. He will be crowned as monarch by wearing St. Edward's crown, one of the items of the symbolic regalia used during the royal ceremony. This crown was made in 1661 of solid gold and it's set with rubies and amethysts and sapphires and garnets and topaz and tourmaline gems. And he will be the seventh monarch to wear this crown in the past 360 years. That's a lot of tradition that's held during those ceremonies. And it's only used, this crown is only used during the coronation ceremony. A crown of life is a royal designation of vitality and life and fruitfulness and love. Jesus declares this reality is an enduring living one, an eternal certainty. It's not a crown that is worn once and then put away, but this is a crown that we get to wear forever. Jesus gives his church in Smyrna the heads up that even though things are not great now, It's going to get worse. Is this an email you would want to get in your inbox? The thing that Jesus says most emphatically is do not be afraid. He identifies what they're dealing with, persecution. That means prison time. That means suffering, even possibly to the point of death. And he also identifies where the responsibility of this lies, the enemy, the devil, not even Emperor Domitian, not the fundamental Jews, not the neighbours or their family members. The responsible entity is the devil. He says this is a test from the devil, the accuser. Remember the story of Job. 
It is the accuser who demands a test, not God. And the response to this test that Jesus asked for is, be faithful. Keep on keeping on, getting through, staying unshakable. Overcoming persecution is not necessarily changing the circumstances to a ceasefire or shifting suffering to soothing. It is actually not denying Jesus. It's staying loyal. It's loving when others say hate. And it's continuing to speak words of love. When others express hate, we love. It's sowing grace when others demand judgment. It's sowing peace when others sow dissension. It is remembering that Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus' encouragement to Smyrna is this. Do not be afraid. Do not give up. Overcome. Be faithful. Even if it means to the point of death. Be unshakable. He was not oblivious to the small battles or the big battles that they fought. To receive this crown, the crown of life, stay faithful, be unshakable, persevere, continue on, take the next breath. Jesus talked about the prophets before him and the persecution that they suffered, not as a, I told you so, But the principle here, people haven't changed that much. It's happened before. It happened to them. It happened to me. It will happen again. Let's have a look at an example where we witness how an awareness of this spiritual reality in Scripture helped God's people to stay unshakable in difficult circumstances. It is an example uh, from the life of the prophet Elisha, who was coming under attack from the king of the neighbouring enemies, the king of Aram. So let's read that out of 1 Kings chapter 6, from verse 10. So the king of Israel checked the place indicated by the man of God. Time and time again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard against certain plots. This enraged the king of Aram, He summoned his officers and demanded of them, will you not tell me which one of us is on the side of Israel? None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go, find out where he is, the king ordered, so that I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there, and they went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down towards him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike these people with blindness. So he, so he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, This is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. And after they entered the city, Jesus said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so that they can see. And then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked. And there they were inside Samaria. 
When the, Lord, when the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall we kill them, my father? Shall we kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill men you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. Here we have a picture of Elisha's unwavering commitment and confidence in the things of God. He was unshakable. So how did he do that? How did he stay unshakable when things seemed to be falling apart? His servant was losing it, but Elisha says, stays steady, unshakable. Regardless of what he saw as he looked out over the city, Elisha understood and accepted there was a parallel spiritual reality that had more authority. Elisha's servant, he only saw what was in front of him, being surrounded by an overwhelming army that was sent to harm them. Elisha saw by faith the parallel reality that God had mobilized his spiritual army in support of his people that those for them were greater than those against. This sounds very much like Jesus who says, I am the first and the last, the one who died and came to life again. I am the first and the last. I have the first word and I have the last word. In this story, Elijah's servant had his eyes open so he could see this spiritual reality. And at the same time, the army of Aram, the enemies of Israel, were struck with blindness. God miraculously opened the eyes of his servants so he could physically see this this spiritual reality with his normal vision. And those who had come to persecute Elisha were actually the blind ones. And this was demonstrated by being struck with temporary blindness. So even though we might not actually see the spiritual reality of what is around us all the time, by faith, we are able to hold on to that same truth by the Holy Spirit. The writer of Hebrews says this, now faith is the confidence in what we hope for, the assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. We can hold an unshakable confidence and assurance about what we do not see by faith. There are things that we cannot physically see, but that does not make these spiritual realities less real or less powerful or less meaningful. That is, we have a life that is eternal, a life that is rich, a life that is full of comfort, a life that is affirmed, a life that is full and abundant, a life that is faithful with unwavering commitment regardless of what is going down. And then the Israelites literally slathered their enemies with kindness. They applied it thick with a trowel. So rather than going in with swords blazing, Elisha guides them to behave in a way that is demonstrating the kindness of God. Elisha was unshakable in a time of war and he coached the Israelites how to respond and do this too. Regardless that their borders had been invaded, the Israelites set before their enemies a feast of mercy. It says they set before them a feast. By faith, they operated from the parallel spiritual reality. And that opened the door on peace in their land. Jesus concludes this letter to Smyrna with these words. I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. This is the punchline to this letter, the climax, the high point. The horror that this world sometimes throws at us does not mean failure. Staying connected to Jesus actually means victory. That's when we win. That's when we receive a crown. Even when there are lies and slander and affliction and persecution and even death, success is being measured in a different way. Overcoming means staying connected to God's unshakable faithfulness. 
That also means there's a reality of the second death, eternal death, after our mortal life is over, and that is not something we have to worry about. Rather, we will experience eternal life, life without end. We mentioned last week that Jesus com compares these seven churches to the menorah, the Hebrew lampstand with seven lamps that casts the light of Jesus out into the dark world. Jesus' message to the church in Smyrna is affirming that quality of being unshakable, holding on to God's faithfulness in a way that does not waver is what will cast the light of his love to others. When we acknowledge that there is a parallel spiritual reality in our world, when we have the revelation that Jesus is the first and the last, more and more we will have confidence in our great unshakable God. And then we become unshakable in our confidence and faith in the goodness of our Father God. Every time we sit at Jesus' feet to learn, to expand our understanding. We're not just becoming more knowledgeable. We're not just learning facts for facts' sake, but we are understanding more of the reality of our relationship with God and who we are in Jesus. We don't have to be afraid. Whatever life throws at us, whether it be suffering or death, whether it being a, surrounded by oppression or being lied about, slandered, living in poverty, we understand God is with us. God is for us. We understand what seems terminal is only temporary. And there is an eternity of God's rich life that Jesus is holding on for us. So let's reflect on some of these ideas around this letter that Jesus wrote to the church in Smyrna. Am I more inclined to focus on what I see around me or the parallel reality of God's faithfulness? Can I remember examples where I have experienced this parallel reality in my life? Where do I feel surrounded and attacked? Are unethical charges being thrown about? Where do I need the army of God to fight for me. I saw a Facebook signature once that said, if you knew that the king of the world has your back, would that change how you live? Would it change how I talk? Would it change what I have a go at? Would it change what is important to me? Would it change wavering to unshakable? Where can I demonstrate unshakable confidence in God's faithfulness this week? Even when things and people and pressures seem to want to divert me from following Jesus and what he has called me to. Pastor Curry Blake was miraculously healed as a baby after a car ran over him right across his head. The doctors said that if he survived, he would be permanently brain damaged and need constant care. But his mother prayed, not just for, for survival, but complete healing. After surgery, the doctor said, well, we can't find any signs of brain damage, but if he lives, he will never have any hair and he will never hear out of his right ear. Blake still has hair and perfect hearing in both ears and he heads up an international healing ministry. But surprisingly, Blake says that when he prays for people, he never prays for boldness. He prays, he says, he prays for a revelation of who we are in Christ, and he teaches that. When we expand our understanding, not just knowledge, just not facts, but when we really understand the reality of our unshakable God and have a revelation of the nature of our relationship with Jesus, we won't be afraid. Boldness comes to life 
Whatever life throws at us, whether it be suffering to the point of death, being surrounded by oppression or being brought before unethical leaders or thrown into a vat of oil like John or sent to the stake like Polycarp, we can stand unshakable. We can understand God is with us and God is for us. We can understand that we live in a parallel reality. We understand what seems terminal is only temporal and we have access to the eternal. I once had a conversation with a young girl who was going to primary school and she often saw visions of Jesus and angels. For her, this was as normal as breakfast, homework and going to school. She talked about Jesus being her best friend, standing beside her, sometimes holding something, sometimes telling her something. Looking at her, you would never know. She just seems like a usual school kid with normal school kid behaviours, with scruffy hair and scuffed shoes and a worn backpack. Yet this opportunity to talk with her allowed me to see that she had a very particular privilege of being physically aware of this parallel reality. She was part of the family of Jesus, and she knew that. He was with her through some very distressing events in her life. Jesus has the last word on suffering. As we have a revelation of who we are in Christ, our unshakable confidence in God's faithfulness is strengthened. This is what Jesus was looking for in his followers, regardless of whether we see that experience in physical ways, like that young girl, or whether we hold on to that truth in faith. We understand the strength of our relationship with God. This is what Jesus was looking for. People who hold on to God, not because we are strong, but because our God is strong and unshakable. This is the quality Jesus wants reflected in his church because we are made in his image. Jesus affirms the unshakable faithfulness of the church in Smyrna. He encourages them to stay faithful, sure, firm, unshakable. And they could do this because Jesus is the first and the last and the one who died and rose again. Polycarp's name means much fruit. Some of the information on Smyrna indicates that, all, uh, that of all the contemporary Turkish communities, it is in this community where the Christian church is stuck the most. That's part of another aspect of this parallel reality. What looked like being squashed down and thrown out was actually born much fruit. Polycarp of Smyrna is acknowledged as one of the great leaders of the early church. So great that we have been inspired by his story centuries after it happened. That's not squashed. That's not discarded. That is bearing much fruit. We can read of the encouragement Polycarp wrote to other churches and his letters remind us even now over and over of the authority of Jesus, the one who died and rose again. Listen to these words of Polycarp. The strong root of your faith, spoken of in days gone by, endures even until now. And it brings forth fruit to our Lord Jesus Christ, who for our sins suffered even unto death, but to whom God raised from the dead, having loosed the bands of the grave. Polycarp understood that. He lived this. He was unshakable. His revelation of who Jesus was made his faith unshakable, and he stood firm in what God had called him to. Unshakable bears much fruit. Jesus, Jesus calls it a crown of life. Their unshakable confidence in God during the suffering in, of this church in John's time became an investment of love and of prayer and of faithful, faithfulness. Their unshakable faith has borne much fruit. When we look at the church in Smyrna, we get a powerful picture of what Jesus wants from his followers in our contemporary church. 
This is how we get ready. This is how we stay ready. This is what Jesus requires of us here now. This is what Jesus wants his people to look like. This is what Jesus wants our church to look like. Jesus is holding his promise of life for us. And if we listen, if we act on these truths, we will be ready for Jesus when he returns, regardless of what life throws at us. This is what Jesus requires of us here now. And this is what he wants our church to look like, an unshakable church that is ready. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that you hold us. We thank you that you are the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the one who died and rose to life again. Father God, we would pray that you would open our eyes so that we can see with faith what is really going on, that we would know and understand that you are all-powerful, You are the omnipotent one. You are the one who holds our lives together. And we thank you that you call us to be able to walk in these truths and that we can because you are strong and unshakable. And as we understand that more and more, Father, we can grow in that quality of being unshakable ourselves. Father, we pray for those circumstances around us that would come and move against us, divert us from the things you've called us to. Father, we know that you see the reality of those things. And we ask, Father God, that we would hold on to your truth, hold on to your hand and know that you are with us. Help us to be unshakable in Jesus' name. Amen.